I want to uh, thank Catherine for a, for a very kind introduction, but especially um, thank her for her participation on the board. I think of all the changes that we've seen at the AMC, one of the biggest changes was the reconfiguration of the board so that it no longer was a block of deans, a block of teaching hospital CEOs and so on, but that by having public members, uh, we could bring in some of the best talent academic medicine has. And Catherine, as she described, self-described her, uh, herself, a lifelong medical educator. I think I see Ree Fincher, uh, who taught me everything I know uh, about medical education when we work together at the Medical College of Georgia, who's also a board member of the AMC. So I think you should feel very good about the way the voice of medical education is, um, is heard so prominently at the highest governance level of the AMC. Uh, I also, I just want to thank all of you for being here. You know, th there's been no shortage of speculation about what does this meeting mean. Uh, to really say what it means, I would go back to the original corporate, not-for-profit corporate charter of the AMC. You may not know this, but since most of our life, 90 years of it as an association was spent here in Illinois, we're incorporated in Illinois, and the corporate charter says, they always have to say what the purpose of the organization is, quote, the purpose for which the AMC is organized is the advancement of medical education, period. So uh, I think when we view how complex our world has become with all the issues in healthcare and research as well as medical education, we should always go back to that as, as really our North Star uh, around association purpose. So what I'd like to do today, do I have the, the driver here? I, uh, I'd like to set a context. I won't wander too far because we are uh, webcasting this to make it as widely available as possible. Uh, but what I'd like to do is create a kind of context for all the sessions, the fantastic sessions I see flowing during this meeting by talking about uh, what our world is experiencing right now at large and then circle back to what I think is an increasing centrality of medical education and of your work. It isn't always recognized, but I'm going to build a case statement for why all these presentations that you've worked so hard on are really critical to the transformation of healthcare in the United States. Uh, I also have entered the Twitterverse, and uh, for those of you uh, under the age of 35, Feel free to also give me feedback on, on my hashtag. I get some very, in, I show this now whenever I present on one of your campuses, I get some really interesting comments back, especially from our students. I have visited uh, dozens and dozens of your institutions just in the last year. <clears throat> I've been struck that in the last 18 months, I've felt a kind of buildup of uncertainty. And the questions that I hear are uh, focused on the problems with NIH funding and this feeling that we may just lose uh, our next generation of scientists. I think that there's tremendous anxiety, especially among our fourth year students, uh, about the future of residency slots. Our business model. Every meeting of the deans that occurs now, they, they refer to the broken business model, and we'll come back to that a little later. What do they really mean? What is their anxiety? Um, when you look at all the court case decisions, as well as some of the state actions, even the vote, some of the voter laws that we see passed in our country, we really wonder how hard it might be for us to continue to have our commitment to diversity. Uh, Catherine mentioned the importance of interprofessional teams. But in a lot of places, I think people are still saying, I'm not sure what it means to create teams or how we do that. And then there are all the mergers and acquisitions. And if your health system goes from being one component of your organization to being a dominant multi-billion dollar multi-site organization, 
What happens to the commitment to academics? And, and a corollary of that is, is if you're suddenly relating to all these community physicians, some of whom you may be calling faculty now, what does it mean for people like you to be a faculty member in the future? Faculty is becoming itself much more diverse. <clears throat> What's fascinating to me, and I didn't appreciate this until I got to the AMC, is uncertainty has been our way of life for about as long as the AMC has been writing about it. So I don't know how many of you have heard of this gentleman. It's Lowell Coggeshell. And Lowell Coggeshell was dean at the University of Chicago in the 60s. And he was very active in what was then the AMC, which was a dean's club. It really, that's all it was, was the medical school deans. And he was asked to write a report on the future uh, of medical education, medical schools. Uh, he really personally drafted most of the report. But what's fascinating is when you read the report, he says, we have, we have these major concerns we're facing. Healthcare costs are rising. The cost of medical education is going through the ceiling. You have to remember tuition at that time at my alma mater was a few hundred dollars a year. Uh, he talked about science and how rapidly science is changing and how that's really challenging our curriculum. It's exactly what we're saying today. So if we had that uncertainty now, almost exactly 50 years ago, and if it mirrors the kind of uncertainty we have now, I guess the first question is, have we been stuck? I would argue no. I would say what's happened is each time we've met the challenge, it's evolved to a new form. And what we've been doing is just trying to stay ahead of this never-ending morphing of the challenges we face, not just in med medical education, but in healthcare delivery and research. Uh, what may be different now, I would argue, is our uncertainty is embedded in what I think is an almost un unprecedented, at least in my lifetime, an unprecedented sense of national uncertainty. Um, some of it may just be all those cable channels <laughs> that we have uh, these, uh, you know, they, they have to create news, right? They have to tell us something. And so we seem to be going through rotating crises. And just in the last few months, if you look at the, the dates on these, it seems like we've shifted. If an economic report comes out, that's the crisis du jour. ISIS, which I'm not minimizing the threat, but ISIS becomes the emphasis one day. Then it's been Ebola. Uh, I was talking with our colleague from Tulane, Karen DeSalvo, who now is being appointed Assistant Secretary of Health to coordinate the Ebola efforts in HHS. And she said, the problem with Ebola in the United States is it's an epidemic of fear, <laughs> fueled in part by, by the news cycle. So we have these events occurring around us, creating uncertainty. And then, of course, when we have uncertainties like these, who do we look to to make us feel comforted? We look to these people. I don't feel particularly comforted. <laughs> we, as was demonstrated uh, 48 hours ago, we have a deeply, deeply divided government. Um, uh, I am a uh, board-certified psychiatrist. I can tell you, uh, I've studied this. These people don't like each other. <laughs> what's, uh, what's actually fascinating is it isn't just across the parties. You know, if you've noticed, just within the last 24 hours, there have been some battle lines drawn between uh, uh, our likely Senate Majority Leader, uh, Senator McConnell, and, and Senator Cruz, right below him. So the frictions are even intra-party now. And uh, I would encourage you to not think this is the product of just our electing people who can't get along. I, I was really enlightened recently when somebody showed me the following information, data gathered by Pew, 
over the last 20 years, and it suddenly made the light bulb go on for me. I'm sorry if this is a little difficult to read, but you can see the legends for 20 years ago, 1994, 10 years ago, 2004, and now 2014. Uh, and what this is, is they array a large number of people that they survey based on their answers to a set of questions. They array people along the uh, consistently liberal side of the spectrum to the left to the consistently conservative side of the spectrum on the right. If you look at 1994, there really wasn't that much difference. There was a middle. Those lines for the median Democrat and the median Republican are pretty close together. And then you look at 2004 and we started drifting apart. And now today, 90% of Republicans are to the right of the median Democrat and similarly, 90% of the Democrats are to the right of the median Republic. Republican. That makes it very hard for people to find a middle. I think this is part of why advertising, which just responds to people's belief, why we saw this barrage of political ads that really were devoid of issues. They were loaded with fear and antagonisms and other things flowing in both directions. So we do have a deeply divided government, but we have a deeply divided populace. I'm not sure that this room, if we surveyed it, would look like this map. I, I tend to think that, that communities, such as medical educators, tend to end up in one part of the spectrum or the other. But this is our country as a whole. And this isn't an abstract, because now this plays out in our world of healthcare. And we, we saw it Tuesday night. This is not the 2012 electoral map for Obama versus Romney. This is where we sit today around states that have agreed to expand Medicaid, <clears throat> bring people in from the uninsured cold, the yellow states versus those gray states that haven't. Look at how carefully it follows the red state, blue state divisions from the last election. Now, there are exceptions, those of you in Arizona no, your very conservative governor, Jan Brewer, had the courage to move forward against some opposition to expand Medicaid. But you have two governors, one of whom, I guess, um, was just reelected. Rick Scott did get reelected, didn't he, in Florida. You have Rick Perry in Texas and Rick Scott. Between them, they could insure almost two million people just by saying yes to the federal Medicaid support. So our politics spill down into the, the real world question for us and our centers of who gets insured or not when they come to our ERs. So we have all that political uncertainty. It spills over into healthcare. And we also still have this fundamental concern about how much we spend and how much we get. The yellow line is the percentage of Americans that are uninsured. And even if we gave, made generous estimates of all the people who've come in under Medicaid, under the ACA, and who've registered in the exchanges, enrolled in exchanges, we're still not back to the levels of percentage of Americans insured that we saw back in the late 90s. The spending, um, for those of us who travel, Dr. Lucy was just in Hong Kong, <laughs> And I know when I travel internationally, I'm always, uh, in one way or another, pinned down by people who are, are fully aware of how far our spending per uh, percentage of GDP surpasses that of other nations. They not only know how much we spend compared to them, but they understand where we rank in relation to them on indices like these. It's always a point of pain for me because often, especially if you get to know your host well and you're having one of those frank uh, discussions over dinner, they'll say, how do, how do you stand it in America? How do you tolerate the fact that you, you just pour so much money into health care and still we can do so much better on an outcome like infant mortality? This is the context in which you're working. 
a context of political divisions that are preventing effective government from working, and it isn't just the people who are elected, it's the divisions we have of ourselves as an electorate. It's the context of all these issues and divides spilling over into health care, preventing even effective implementation of things like Medicaid expansion, and it's this core issue of value. Spending so much, but having outcomes that lag the rest of the world. This is the, the context in which we're trying to educate the next generation. Just to layer on to all of this, we have the reality that we may not have enough doctors. You know, I know this issue gets debated. Uh, I personally have participated in debates about the topic, but, uh, and we are, even as we speak, we are working on new analyses of our data to try and pin down what the exact number is. But I can tell you, whether it's 100,000, 125,000, 75,000, we are not going to have enough doctors in 2025. That is the reality. Not only that, as medical educators, with your contact with students, you know that the rate-limiting step in all this is the GME bottleneck. And it isn't waiting for our full medical school expansion to occur. It's happening now. We saw it in the last two years. Uh, two years ago, even after the SOAP, after the match, after the SOAP, 500-plus USMD seniors got no GME position, no PGY1 position. This last year, over 400, despite all your best efforts at counseling and advising. So layered on to these larger problems of access, cost, political partisanship, we have this very specific issue of the shortage of GME positions. How is this then drilled down to our campuses, to, to you? You may, you may or may not know the numbers on your campus, but if I roll up all 141 of the U.S. Uh, medical school members, not, not the uh, Canadian members of the AMC, um, the finances are an interesting thing. Basically, we only get three kinds of fund streams. What we get for education, right? That's what tuition and appropriations are for. At least our state legislators, uh, legislatures think that's what they're for. We get those grants and contracts for research, and we do clinical care. And then we try to carry out our three missions. Uh, the problem is our financial reality in most places is very murky. In fact, after 13 years as a dean, I realized that, that almost everybody believes that actually the dean is skimming off the pot right here. <laughs> I, you know, maybe this is in the Cayman Islands, maybe it's in the bottom, bottom drawer of the desk, but it's so murky that everybody believes somewhere there must be a special slush fund or pot of money because I just don't feel down here on the front lines of education that I'm getting my due share. How does this translate to the way our budgets look? If you roll up all the medical schools, what you see in terms of the sources of revenue, look at that. All the medical schools in the U.S. have a total revenue now of over $100 billion a year. That breaks down, as you can tell, to hundreds of millions a year for each school on average. Um, the revenue sources are shown here. And the reality is we have grown more and more dependent on our clinical revenues, what comes from the hospital and what comes from our own faculties clinical practice. You see the, the lighter blue or, or uh, turquoise shaded uh, research sources of research funding. Sorry about that. One more. There we go. Look at fees, tuition and fees, 4%. Um, look at uh, government, parent university support, 5%. Those are the things that typically we would say are the educational support, and they're pretty weak. So if you go back to the notion of the cauldron, it's become obvious that we are using those physician and hospital revenues, 
this is getting to me. Those physician and hospital revenues, we are using them not only to support the clinical care we deliver, but to cross-subsidize down here, down here. That worked well for us for a long time, but this is now our uncertainty at the ins institutional level. The ability of the clinical enterprise to subsidize the educational enterprise is going to be seriously hurt by a whole set of actions that are being taken. I won't go through the color coding on these bars, but they represent things like penalties for patients being readmitted or cuts in disproportionate share payments because putatively more and more of our patients are being insured. Um, and this does not include some of the other cuts that are threatened, such as cuts to GME funding. So if you go forward over the years on this graph and you see literally billions of dollars taken out of the teaching hospital and practice side of our institutions, it stresses the research and education side. But on those sides, things don't look great either. The yellow bars are NIH total funding per year adjusted for inflation. And if you look at it, this, this fiscal year, we're down to a level of NIH support that in terms of buying power is about where we were at the turn of the century. So the research enterprise is suffering. I'm sure you hear this from your colleagues. So what are we going to do? I would argue that the answer does not lie in increasing tuition. I think the feeling that most of the people in this room probably have when you look at the, the numbers for cost of attendance and debt, I'm sure the feeling shared by most of us is we've pushed this to the limit. It's at the point where hopefully students can bear what they've got now, but if we add on to this burden, it's really going to be challenging for them. So in our own world, there's this fundamental uncertainty about what I called at the very beginning our business model. This is what the deans struggle with when they convene as the Council of Deans. It's one of the things I know that will be talked about at the Learn, Serve, Lead uh, annual meeting following this one by hospital CEOs, practice plan leaders, and others. You know, it's ironic. I've painted all these uncertainties. I've painted all the stresses on us. But now I'm going to tell you the bottom line, which is that despite all this, if we're going to fix the healthcare system, stabilize this system, it falls to us to accomplish that goal. The reason I'd argue that is this infographic that we developed that I don't think most of us have really appreciated. So if you look at the very top, our, our teaching hospitals are only 5% of the hospitals in the US. But look at the, we deliver a t nearly a quarter of all the clinical care. And then when it comes to charity care, care for the uninsured, we deliver over a third of it. And then if you look at the bottom of the infographic, you know if somebody needs a level one trauma center, a NICU, a burn unit, a cancer center, a comprehensive cancer center, they're going to want to be at one of our member hospitals. So whether we like the fact or not, we sit at the epicenter of the healthcare system. In many ways, I'm certain it doesn't feel this way day to day, we're the most organized part of the healthcare system. <laughs> you think we're fragmented, you should see some of the other parts. So there's really nobody else to do this job of transformation other than our medical schools and teaching hospitals. We have to create this kind of seamless system of the future, one that gets out of the mothership of the university hospital, links to everything from <coughs> community-based primary care to home health to pharmacies and so on. They're actually, if you're interested in how your work probably fits with where the health system has to change and go, your academic system, I strongly recommend this AMC report to you, which you can download off the website. It's called Advancing 
uh, the academic health system for the future. And several of you, ranging from Iowa to uh, UCSF to Mass General to uh, uh, a set of others, about 13 institutions, helped us do a deep dive on what are the kinds of changes we're going to have to make to lead that transformation. I strongly commend the report. Even if you don't read the whole report, take 10 minutes or less, read the executive summary, and you'll really get a sense of what the change agenda is that we all share. So now let's look at your role in all this. I would submit that we cannot have the healthcare workforce we need unless medical education becomes a leader in the, in the transformation process. That is going to, I believe, change the identities of medical education. I was shocked when I saw this, uh, this article uh, come out this week in Academic Medicine. It, it has, talk about a catchy title. Uh, it certainly gets your attention. Medical education is the ugly duckling of the medical world. But when you read the article, what you find out is that it's a very, very thoughtful uh, critique. It actually, interestingly, comes from the United Kingdom, not from the US, and shows how our problems are not necessarily unique. It's a fascinating critique of how we have to change our identity in medical education from being peripheral to one of being central. And I would argue the way we do that was actually one of the points that Lowell Coggeshell highlighted 50 years ago, which is we push to link all the parts of the continuum, finally. He actually got a lot of pushback when he stressed in that report, Coggeshell report, the notion of creating a better full continuum of medical education. Now I think we're finally there, and I think it's reinforced for me by the work I see being presented at this meeting. So much of which is not limited to one of these boxes, but rather so much of the work you're presenting is really focused on the right-hand side, which is what is the end product we're trying to produce to work in the clinic at the bedside, perhaps lead the health system. The other element, and thread as it were, that I see coming to prominence now that I think is really finally affirming the centrality of medical education is the emphasis on learning and assessment of competencies. When I sit with our counterparts in the, cer the board certifying bodies, uh, in the, uh, uh, the world of licensure, it's all about competencies. And you're the people who are defining that. What does that translate to in terms of things like entrustable professional activities? All of the kinds of efforts, many of which I see highlighted in this meeting. The AMC is going to try and do its part. We're, we're finally realizing, A, we need to focus on a broader array of supporting services for these parts of the continuum. Some of them you see at the desk just outside by breakfast by the breakfast setup, services that aren't just MCAT, uh, AMCAS, and IRAS, but services like the global health uh, learning opportunities to link students to international opportunities, um, use of the data commons to draw data together from different sources. Ultimately, we hope PIVIO as a electronic-based portfolio that draws not only data from all these sources, but data from the NBME uh, boards and other sources can be a way that we'll tie this continuum together. And you'll be able to know as medical educators whether what you did upstream had the desired impact downstream. I mean, don't you have those moments when you wonder, is this really going to have an impact on what kind of doctor this person becomes? I think we're finally moving into a world where we can measure that. Uh, I, I, this is just a, a random sampling of the titles, but what I'm struck by, you pick any one of these, is what I struck, I'm struck by is how no longer is medical education taking a marginalized, isolated perspective, but how much you're talking in many of these presentations about creating leadership in the health system, about creating a positive environment 
not just learning environment, but a positive environment for patients. So over the next two days, you're going to do a deep dive on tactical things we can do in medical education. And then in the meeting that follows, and I'm, I'm so gratified that uh, I think over 300 of you have registered to also come uh, to the meeting. There, people are going to rise to the higher level of how do these things all tie together when you look at the academic healthcare enterprise as a whole? How does it move us into broader kinds of transformation? But for every presentation you sit in over the next two days, I'd encourage you to have this thought in the back of your mind. If you believe that Don Berwick and the IHI folks were right when they, they really started pushing the concept of the triple aim, if you believe they're right, does what you're talking about, the educational innovation you're working on, does it improve the care for the individual? You know, perhaps the communication skills with the patient? Does it improve our ability to look at the population as a whole? Population health has not historically been our focus. And does it actually help us manage cost? I would argue that a lot of the quality and safety education work you've become so active in actually will have as one of its benefits re reducing the overall cost. So I think the goal, you will be very much, as you should be over the next two days, down on the front lines of what you do at different points in the con continuum. But I hope you periodically say, is this the kind of thing that will move us into a better position to accomplish the triple aim, first in our academic health center and then in the nation overall. So what I'd like to do now, I want to have some time for discussion, especially on, on these issues, because that's, admittedly, they're my observations from 50,000 feet. But uh, I, I wanted to just say a few things. First of all, I do want to thank Kate, who I took her blood pressure and pulse this morning. I thought I'd have to... Uh, uh, send her to the hospital, but she's rallied, and she has worked so, so hard on this with all our colleagues. So, Kate, we, we thank you. And now there's somebody who I won't even need to name, but I'm going to ask this person in a moment to stand. Uh, but um, she has made a decision. It does not involve anything remotely like retirement. <laughs> It is what she refers to as taking control of her schedule. Uh, and this woman uh, has done everything, not just in academic medicine, but at the AMC, in her tenure at the AMC, she has done every position uh, she was asked to do and has covered an amazing number of bases. But I can still recall the day when she said, we were talking about her assuming this position of chief medical education officer, creating the role the way we needed to have it to emphasize med-ed. She said, Daryl, you know, this is my passion. Uh, and it is her passion, and I've been deeply grateful for that, as I knew you have. She hates this, but I'm going to ask Carol Ashenbrenner to stand and give a Queen Elizabeth wave. <laughs> Bravo. And she's going to hate this even more, but there's going to be a bit of recognition at the poster session tonight. So Carol, you have to be at the poster session too. And you can, once again, just stand and, and do the wave. Uh, and somebody who I, I think increasingly needs no introduction, and you saw, perhaps saw her photo on the walk-in slides, but I asked Mary Ellen Gussick uh, to stand up as our new Chief Medical Education <laughs> Officer. <laughs> Uh, Mary Ellen came to us, many of you know, she was an endowed professor of pediatrics and headed medical education at Indiana. I had the pleasure of knowing her, uh, first knowing her 15 years ago when she came to Penn State on a third grade visit, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> health, health fair for elementary school, fair for elementary school st <laughs> students. Uh, I think she is going to be the perfect contact transducer that this community needs with the AMC, with its governing body, and, and the rest of the components of the AMC. 
uh, it's really, we're really fortunate, and if you have a chance during the course of the meeting, please introduce yourself so she can get to know the community better. And lastly, I want to talk a bit about this meeting. There's no question, there's a lot of experiment going on here. We've never held a meeting like this. In fact, if you set aside these, these three ring circuses that we call the annual meeting <laughs> that have approached three and 4,000 attendees, this is the largest meeting the AMC has ever held. And uh, I think it is very important to acknowledge that we're doing it because of that corporate charter and because of the centrality of medical education uh, to the entire healthcare transformation process. We know that as an experiment, there will be glitches, there will be things we can do better, and we want to have your feedback, your participation. I believe there are a couple focus groups, Kate, you mentioned, that are scheduled. There'll be ample opportunity. Um, uh, to do an evaluation after the meeting, and I promise you I do this after the, the uh, uh, Learn, Serve, Lead meeting. I'll do it after this meeting. I read every one of your comments, so be gentle. Um, <laughs> most of all, I appreciate the work you did in creating this program. I mean, there was an incredible outpouring of, of presentations, and that's just been fantastic. We will continue this meeting. The planning has, has now confirmed that we can hold it next year in Baltimore and there will be no space constraints. Uh, I personally apologize that the outpouring of interest in this meeting pushed us past the capacity that we knew we had. And we have capacity problems both for this meeting and Learn, Serve, Lead. We were able to get 200 of you off the wait list. There were another 200 who weren't but were uh, we're making it uh, easier and offering a financial break for them to uh, register for next year where we'll have no limitations. So you can give yourself, uh, text yourself a save the date for um, November 10th through 12th, right, in Baltimore ne for next year's Learn, Serve, Lead. So with that, what I'd, what I'd like to do is open it up to a few comments or questions about this meeting, the work you're doing, how it fits with this challenge we have of healthcare transformation, any of the concepts that, that I put forward uh, in my presentation. I have a very hard time seeing past the lights, but do use the mic. You, you can go ahead, use the mic because that way they can pick it up on the webcast too. I'm curious about the um, very interesting financial layout of academic medical centers that you gave us. I'm wondering how you conceptualize the medical schools that are not part of a clinical enterprise and how that differs with what you showed and where they fit in your vision for the AAMC. Well, I think the, the bottom line is in some ways, uh, when you look at the financial profile of schools that don't have their own partnered clinical enterprise that is supporting the school, those schools have been leaner when you look, when you do an LCME visit and you look at their financial layout. They typically have had to, to because they don't have the benefit of those cross subsidies, focus a little bit more on a tighter structure, more cost efficient structure. I think quite, quite honestly it also is harder for those institutions to build a larger research enterprise. That doesn't mean they don't do research but to build a larger research enterprise. In some ways, this is just a personal observation, if we lose more of our ability to cross-subsidize from the clinical side, a lot of medical schools are going to have to learn from those institutions who've had to be leaner for their entire history because of their makeup. The other thing I find curious is that you uh, find some of those schools now looking for clinical partners, <laughs> realizing that times are going to be very tough and hoping that they can find a clinical partner that is not yet engaged in medical education that has interest in doing that. We've seen that with some of the new schools that have been formed in partnership with strong health systems uh, that were able to commit financially to the school. Other comments? Right. I'm sorry. Over here. 
Go right ahead. And if Thank you wouldn't you. mind saying who you are and where you're from. Uh, Rachel Alloway, Northern Ontario School of Medicine in Canada. Uh, so I'd like to get, ask you to reflect a little bit on your use of we, us, and you. Um, coming from a Canadian school, our experiences in some ways are different. Our relationship with the government, for instance, is very different. But, and this isn't a Canada bashing thing, what I'd really like you to think about is the social contract and our relationship with society and the communities that we serve. And certainly in the Canadian context, we're looking more and more at the community relationship as a fundamental driver, enabler, and supporter of the medical enterprise. And I wonder to what extent in the, the United States that's also an opportunity that maybe hasn't necessarily been explored as much as possible. And an indication of that was in the last couple of years I've attended this meeting is when there are meetings on the social mission of schools, they're very thinly attended, even though the room next door on EPAs is extremely full. What, to what extent can the United States really embrace a social mission for medical education? I think we're at a time in the United States, um, and again, you just have to look at some of the um, issues that people ran on in this election. They weren't really issues as much as emotions. One of the emotions is getting government out of things. And if you get governmental support out of things, I would argue that that does threaten social goods, public goods, right? Whether it's medical education or medical research or funding for clinical care. So I'm not the, the only observer. You, you can frequently read articles that talk about the, the apparent erosion of the social contract in many spheres in the United States. I was at a meeting yesterday morning where they were discussing, um, two days ago, where they were discussing universities, public universities, and the constant decline in state funding for them. So whether it's education, research, clinical care, roads, grade schools, I think America is struggling with the notion of do we have a contract, a bilateral contract to support those things, and will those things help make us a stronger nation? That is really, um, I believe, under debate in a very concerning way in this country, because I would argue that what made the United States strong was having a reasonably strong social contract in those dimensions. But um, I'm always struck when I visit Canada that it seems somewhat different there. I don't know, did they just, somewhere in the Atlantic, did they point some boats north and some boats south? based on how they felt about government? And yes, they did. <laughs> Thank you. My public policy officer always rolls his eyes and winces when I say things like that. Please. Uh, Sandrine Van Sheik, University of California, San Francisco. Um, I was very pleased to hear you say that you thought medical education really has to play a very central role in the future. Um, but I'm a little bit puzzled how that fits with the AAMC's decision to separate this meeting from the overall AAMC meeting. And I would like to hear your... I didn't expect that. But I would like to hear your thoughts, how we can ensure that there is crosstalk between the people who are the innovative thinkers in this meeting, and I think you used the word, the big picture, people who attend the overall um, annual meeting. Well, first of all, 350, I think it is, of you will be at that annual meeting. But you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be very honest uh, about this. I know that, that there's been widespread debate and widely differing opinions on the virtue of having a national high-profile focused medical education meeting. And the fundamental question is, is it going to marginalize medical education or affirm and strengthen medical education? All I can do is say, A, I believe the latter is not only possible, I can tell you the entire board of, of directors of the AMC, I and all the leadership team are committed to making it the latter, to strengthening the role of medical education. But that goes far, far, far beyond the three or 4,000 people that will be in Chicago this week. There are 120,000 faculty, 141 deans. What we really need to be thinking about isn't, uh, I, I would argue, it isn't so much what's the right structure for an annual meeting of the entire association 
what's the right structure for this meeting. But what we need to focus on is the point you made, which is how do we interact across all the groups more effectively. You know, you have a head start. When we gather all the people interested in diversity, it would not be 1,100 plus people. You know, this is the largest meeting of, of an AMC component that's ever been held. I would expect next year, I would be surprised if we didn't hit 1,500. Because I think all of you will create such energy in this meeting. And then we will work tirelessly as a staff to transfer that uh, into every other group, deans, hospital CEOs, pra pra practice plan leaders. You know, the, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. There wasn't that much interaction at the prior annual meeting structure. One of the issues in the annual meeting has always been that it was, to use Catherine's term, a federated meeting of subgroups who happened to be in the same hotel. So let's, uh, let's commit to working together to affirm that centrality and make the connections. I would make a personal plea to people, let's move forward in that direction now. Thank you. And on that note, and given that it's after nine, let's move forward. Uh, we have a break, and Kate, you're going to, hold on, Kate is going to tell us where we are and where we're going, which is always important at a meeting like this. So run up here, Kate.